What do we know about the guy in charge of the mailman? The Wildcat strike. The workers are in charge. 20,000 postal workers don't just march in step. Somebody's leading them. Find out who. Sam, I want to run this picture. Jersey City Post Office with so much backed up mail, they can't store it indoors. Get down there, write me something good. <sighs> this scene is part of a fictional television series, but the story behind it is very real. Late on the evening of March 17, 1970, 1,551 rank-and-file letter carriers in New York City voted to do something that had never been done before. In an ultimate act of civil disobedience, they voted to strike against the federal government, igniting an illegal work stoppage that spread across the country like wildfire, crippling the nation's postal system. All in favor of staying out! Why did they do it? Who were the players? And how did America's letter carriers win a raise, collective bargaining, and the respect of a nation? A half century later, this is our story, one of defiance, struggle, and triumph, the revolt of the good guys. My name is Wally Padulo, and the opening scene of this program brings back a flood of memories. I carried mail in Jersey City, New Jersey for 36 years. In March of 1970, I was 25 years old and had just begun my seventh year as a letter carrier. I loved my job. Serving the public was an honor and a privilege. But like most letter carriers, I did not love the money. And the really tough part was that, for America's letter carriers, there was no promise at all of making better money. We performed a vital and important job. Many of my co-workers were proud military veterans. Our customers respected and appreciated us. So why were we so underpaid? In order to understand how postal workers came to be treated so badly, and what we did to right that wrong, we need to jump back in history to a time before most of us were even born. The United States Postal Service, as we know it today, did not exist in 1970. Those of us who worked at the post office back then were employed by a completely different entity, the United States Post Office Department, a cabinet-level department of the federal government subject to congressional micromanagement. And because of that, we literally needed an act of Congress to get a raise. Our salaries had to be approved by both houses of Congress and then signed into law by the president. There was no such thing as collective bargaining, so we had no say in our wages, benefits, or working conditions. We jokingly referred to it as collective begging, except it wasn't a joke. It was a real mess. From 1900 to 1925, raises averaged $40 a year. From 1925 to 1943, raises averaged nothing. That's from 1925 to 1943, nothing. From 19... 43 to 1969, 200 dollars a year. From 1953 through 1961, President Dwight Eisenhower vetoed four postal pay bills, calling them unfair, unnecessary, inflationary, and a menace to the national debt. Well, we'd lost a lot of members when Eisenhower kept vetoing the bill. I was very disappointed in the Eisenhower veto, and I showed it in my face and everywhere else. And I sat on a plane with Walter Ruther coming home. He said, what's the matter with you? You look awful. I said, well, we just went through another veto. He said, you know your problem? You've got to unionize your association. Well, that was in 1954. What the legendary head of the United Auto Workers Union meant was that to be a real union, you need real collective bargaining. Fourteen years later, James H. Rademacher of Detroit would go on to become president of the National Association of Letter Carriers. 
and he would get the chance to make Ruther's advice a reality. But he would need help, which he got from the two other major players in this story. President Richard Nixon, who was in the second year of his presidency, and drank and file letter carrier Vincent Sombrato of New York City. These three men were thrust together as the prime movers in the largest wildcat strike in U.S. history, illegally targeting the United States government. And as time would tell, neither one of them alone could have accomplished what the three of them unwittingly did together. Following the Eisenhower vetoes came the tragically short tenure of President John F. Kennedy. On January 17, 1962, Kennedy signed Executive Order 10988, which recognized the right of federal employees to collectively bargain. But it did not give them the right to strike, and it did not allow for wage bargaining. So, Demands for increased pay were ignored again and again, year after year. Underlying all of this was the fact that the fate of our salaries, like all post office spending, was in the hands of Congress. Wages were meager and stagnant. Postal facilities were run down and in many cases decrepit. Severely underpaid postal workers toiled in buildings that were freezing in the winter and sweltering in the summer. Vehicles and equipment broke down regularly, resulting in poor service. Not only didn't the post office work for its workers, it didn't work for the American people either. A dramatic example of this growing postal crisis occurred in October of 1966. The Chicago Post Office, the world's largest postal facility, suffered a total meltdown that paralyzed service. The situation was so bad that the post office was given permission to destroy large amounts of third-class mail to clear the backlog. The postmaster general at the time, Lawrence O'Brien, famously declared that the post office was in a race with catastrophe. Responding to this crisis, President Lyndon Johnson created a commission to analyze postal problems and make recommendations for fixing them. The Capitol Commission recommended that the post office be transitioned into a government-owned postal corporation, which would operate on a self-supporting basis. Fearing that a postal corporation would lead to privatization, a loss of pensions, and the end of universal service, NALC was not in favor. Well, we had no part of that. I testified frequently, we're against that. We want no corporation running the postal service. Barely two months after the Capitol Commission issued its report, James Rademacher was elected NALC's national president at the union's 1968 convention in Boston. I was so eager to get the presidency, I never thought about uh, problems. But you remember during the 60s what happened? Bobby Kennedy shot and uh, Martin Luther King shot. Uh, pretty rough. But uh, I was more concerned about what am I going to do as president, especially with two resolutions asking for strike. And scary. At that convention, the membership considered two strike resolutions. The first was to work toward having the no-strike clause stricken from Kennedy's executive order, and the second was to investigate the feasibility of a strike. Both resolutions were disapproved, but they served to further seed the idea of a strike with the membership. And then you had the whole country during the Vietnam going against authority. You had a revolutionary spirit in the country. People didn't worry about laws. At that time, you just were out there spotting your, your grievances to try to make conditions better. And that's the environment we were in. Dr. Joseph McCartan is a professor of history at Georgetown University. His research focuses on labor unions and worker rights. 
Yeah, the mood of the country in 1970 was um, sort of like you could say a kind of tinderbox. The upheavals of the 60s and the cultural changes of the 60s, including the civil rights movement, including the Vietnam War. Many postal workers were veterans of the armed services. Some of them had just returned from Vietnam. There was a growing distrust of government. There was a rising incidence of protests of all kinds at the end of the 1960s. Largely as a reaction to the turmoil of the 1960s, Richard Nixon was elected president in 1968. Nixon would continue to face headwinds, as would NALC President James Rademacher. Within Rademacher's first year in office, discontent spread among his members as Congress continued to play ping pong with postal pay legislation. The following February, concerned about inflation, the Nixon administration recommended an insulting pay increase of 4.1%. This soon after Congress voted itself a 41% pay raise. The timing could not have been worse. It was at this point that Rademacher began to foreshadow the likelihood of a wildcat strike. The postal system was broken and President Nixon was eager to fix it. Henry Cashin served under John Ehrlichman as Deputy Counsel for Domestic Affairs in the Nixon White House. There were complaints about the delivery and about the efficiency and, and how the, uh, the post office was run that were brought to the attention of the president. And it was raised by members of Congress that uh, it was uh, time for a hard look at, at the post office and the potential postal reform. How to fix the post office? Well, like a lot of things, especially in Washington, it was complicated. Nixon was obsessed with rising inflation and its potential political fallout. So the idea of increasing the federal budget to support pay increases and a crumbling postal infrastructure was off the table. On the other hand, the Capital Commission plan to create a self-supporting postal corporation was very appealing because it would remove salaries and other postal expenses from the federal budget. The corporation plan soon became one of Nixon's top priorities. In early February of 1969, Nixon began his sales pitch for the corporation plan by visiting post office department headquarters in Washington. He praised top management for their dedication and prepared them for changes to come. This is gonna be a period of change in this department. Some of these changes are going to be difficult. And I would hope that as you talk to the people that you supervise, let them know uh, that we in Washington appreciate what they're doing. Let them know that we back them. Let them know that better days are coming. While Nixon and Postmaster General Winton Blunt promoted the corporation plan, NALC pushed back, and that's where things got interesting. In May of 1969, Rademacher organized a two-day political action conference that drew 3,500 NALC members and numerous members of Congress. At that meeting, delegates urged legislators to oppose a postal corporation and then went to Capitol Hill to lobby for their position. But later that month, Nixon sent his reform plan to Congress and vowed to veto any bill that didn't convert the post office department into a postal corporation. This is the most significant reform bill ever sent to the Congress, ever offered by an administration uh, in this area. It will dramatically improve the working conditions uh, for the 750,000 men and women who work in the Postal Service. Well, do I think it was a good idea? Yes, I, did. I think it was a good idea. The postal, uh, post office was uh, stagnated. I mean, it, it needed a, a, a facelift. It needed something to get done to, to avoid strikes and, and uh, uh, inhibition and the delivery of mail and the things that were so important to the, uh, to the American people. Barely one month later, Nixon officially announced his meager 4.1% pay increase. 
NALC members exploded. Rademacher attempted to calm the waters by issuing a controversial open letter to his membership, urging them to cool it and not take any drastic actions that would get them fired, fined, or jailed. Well, another mistake I made, I put out a bulletin, and we put out a weekly bulletin, and I put down cool it. They didn't want to cool it. They wanted to go the other direction. So they got very unhappy about that. Just a week later, Rademacher testified before Congress, laying out a comprehensive analysis that totally disproved the government's position that a 4.1% increase was adequate. Under questioning, he admitted that he could no longer control his members. I appeared before Congress on the committee, and I said, I no longer control the membership. I said, They're, they want to strike. The next day, there's headlines that uh, I had said there's going to be a strike. The post office immediately started getting out literature what to do in the case of a strike. Rademacher's 1969 testimony may have been the first official public reference to the possibility of a strike. However, the post office department clearly knew a strike was brewing a year earlier when it published its coordination plan for civil disorder in May of 1968. On July 17, 1969, Rademacher did one of his first national TV appearances on NBC's Today Show with host Bill Monroe. He bashed Nixon's corporation plan and accused the administration of offering only an ugly little parody of collective bargaining. On September 2, 1969, Nixon held a major press conference at the Western White House in San Clemente, California, to push the postal reform plan. Our present postal system is obsolete. It has broken down. Uh, it is not what it ought to be for a nation uh, of 200 million people and a nation that will be 300 million within 30 years. And now is the time to act. A central figure in Nixon's efforts was his postmaster general, Wynton Blunt. Blunt was a wealthy, conservative business owner from Alabama, and notably the only Southerner in Nixon's cabinet. And he was all in on the plan for a postal corporation. Just one week after the San Clemente press conference, Blunt appeared on the public affairs program Firing Line, hosted by conservative columnist William F. Buckley, Jr. Now, why is it that um, there has been um, so little enthusiasm for this plan, which, which would strike uh, most people, I think, as manifestly better to the, than the existing arrangements, on the part, first of all, of um, the post office employees themselves? Is it fear of unknown things? I think that's uh, essentially it. Uh, you see, we are talking about drastic legislation. This is the first time that you've ever talked about taking a cabinet department and removing it from cabinet status. Nixon was adamant about tying any pay increase to a postal corporation. Rademacher remained steadfastly opposed, fearing that his members would lose their civil service status and their retirement benefits. And the Congressional Postal Committees, led by Senator Gail McGee of Wyoming and Representative Thaddeus Dulski of New York, were also opposed because they didn't want members of Congress to lose their ability to dole out the postmaster patronage jobs that they had controlled for decades. Meanwhile, things got so bad that 40 letter carriers in Brooklyn, New York, applied as a group for welfare benefits. Their actions were meant to draw attention to their plight, but in fact, most actually needed the benefits in order to support their families. I don't favor strikes, but when they become necessary, like I told Congress, I can't control these people. They're not eating properly. They're working three jobs. They're getting food stamps. They work, they work for the government of the United States getting food stamps. That's outrageous. While Rademacher pushed his non-corporation version of a pay bill, those who supported Nixon and the Capital Commission's recommendations pushed their own version, which included a corporation. 
an intense legislative tug of war ensued. To bolster their case, NALC initiated a major public information campaign called Save Our Service, or SOS. Comedian Jerry Lewis, a longtime friend of the letter carriers, lent his support to the campaign. More than 400 NALC branches nationwide ran full-page newspaper ads targeted to an audience of 54 million people with the message, no corporation needed. Postal customers were asked to write to President Nixon urging him to support the non-corporation plan. The goal was to get six million postcards, letters, and telegrams sent to the White House. Within two weeks, the White House was inundated. NALC's plan worked, and it sure got Nixon's attention. We sent six million letters to the President of the United States, do not veto that bill. And that was in December. I got this call from Charles Colson, who was the President's administrative assistant. And he said, we, want, we got your message, we want to meet with you. On the afternoon of Friday, December 5th, Rademacher was summoned to the White House to meet with Nixon's aides. In a somewhat odd alliance, he had developed a cordial relationship with White House counsel Chuck Colson. Chuck got involved, Ehrlichman got involved, I got involved in the staff work to put together the framework for postal reorganization. The way we were going to get postal reform was to work with Rademacher and what was acceptable to him and, and what was negotiable with him and what was a compromise as far as, as letter carriers were concerned. Over two days of meetings with Colson and Cashin, Rademacher laid his cards on the table, explaining his opposition to the Postal Corporation. I said, I don't want to work for a corporation. Okay, scratch it. What do you want? I said, first, uh, Postal Service. That's what we are for. The, that's what we're there for. Okay, scratch that. So we went through it. What else do you want? I said, I want the employees to remain under civil service. I don't care who takes over. Okay, you got that. What's next? What else do you want? I said, the most important thing of all, I want collective bargaining instead of collective begging. He says, is it that bad? I said, it's worse. Without Rademacher, we'd have had nothing. I mean, the only way this was going to work was to have the administration uh, uh, support uh, and have the union support. And uh, uh, I mean, we all came to the conclusion that something needed to be done and wanted to do it the right way. And Nixon's objective was uh, to put together the corporation and make it uh, um, an entity which, which was supported by the union, supported by the, by the administration, and productive for the American people. Although there were seven exclusive postal unions, Internal White House communications pointed to Rademacher as being the leading voice for postal labor. The administration believed that he could help broker an agreement acceptable to the other postal unions and to AFL-CIO President George Meany, and that's exactly what happened. Rademacher, Colson, and Cashin negotiated a compromise plan that would maintain civil service benefits, yet pave the way for the transition to a postal corporation. It would provide for a 5.4% pay increase retroactive to July of 1969, and most importantly, it would allow for collective bargaining with binding arbitration for all future wage negotiations instead of the right to strike. Just two weeks later, Rademacher returned to the White House for a meeting with Nixon, Chuck Colson, Henry Cashin, and the President's Counsel for Domestic Affairs, John Ehrlichman. By agreeing to a compromise that included a pay raise and a postal corporation, Rademacher had broken ranks with the other postal unions, and Nixon wanted to express his gratitude for Rademacher's support. But that support would prove difficult for Rademacher, who was now facing the challenge of getting six angry postal unions to back the compromise plan. It also painted him as a sellout in the eyes of many of his members. Yeah. 
As 1970 began, Rademacher worked with the other postal unions to gain their support for the corporation plan. After negotiations, they reached an agreement that demanded a two-step increase to be paid that year, 5.4% retroactive to January 1st, and a second raise of at least 5.7% once the reorganization plan was signed into law. Reaching top pay in eight years instead of 21 years was also included. But just when it looked like a deal had been reached, Nixon's economic advisor, Arthur Burns, pressured him to limit federal spending. Nixon caved and reneged on his promise. To save money, he decided to delay federal pay raises by six months. This angered Rademacher's members and made him look weak in the eyes of the other unions. One by one, the six other postal unions backed out of the seven union deal. Rademacher blasted Nixon's decision, accusing the administration of balancing the budget at the expense of dedicated government workers. And now there was trouble on Capitol Hill as well. Representative Dulski, chair of the House Postal Committee, reverted to his original bill of a pay raise without a corporation. Rademacher said that Dulski's action and Nixon's threatened veto of it would be a forerunner to the first national postal strike in history, adding, my people have had all they can take. So we're all set to go, and they dilly-dally, whether it's the Dulski bill or whose bill it is, and they waited months, and then finally, on March 17th, there's a strike. It wasn't like Rademacher hadn't sounded a warning about a strike. Rademacher knew it, Nixon knew it, and the Congress knew it but they didn't think we would actually do it. Well, they were wrong. Little did they know, these conditions I'm talking about had so permeated the minds of the, the letter carriers that nothing was going to dissuade them. Sobrato looks back on the strike vote, which took place the evening of March 17th at New York's Manhattan Center. And they're starting now to count off the machines. Machine number one, Strike, two to one. Machine number two, strike. So when they got to the sixth machine, I believe it was six machines, they tallied up the, the vote and it was 15, 15, 1,000. And to his credit, and I've always given him credit for this, the president of Branch 36, Gus Johnson said, the vote, the membership has spoken, Branch 36 is on strike, Shop stewards, go to your stations and mount your, your picket lines. And they started screaming all over the voting hall, strike, strike, strike tomorrow morning. And then they voted, strike, strike, and everybody yelled, strike, strike. Tomorrow morning, at 5 o'clock, be in front of the post office, the main post office. I was there. I was there. Gus Johnson of New York City, he called me at midnight and he said, they have passed the motion to strike, and they're on strike, and I said, let it blow. That's all I said, let it blow. Today in New York City, letter carriers went out on strike for the first time in American history. They were supported by all the other postal unions, and nobody crossed their picket lines with the exception of a few supervisors. As for the first time ever, letter carriers went on strike and mail service in and out of New York was suspended. The government immediately obtained a court order against the strike, and union leaders ordered the carriers back to work. Many refused. No right is more fundamental to workers, uh, and no right has been more important to workers' ability to organize and bargain uh, in U.S. history than the right to strike. In my truck, I had some oak tag. Just happened to be there. They took it out, they wrote out on strike, you know, <laughs> and that's how, that was, there was no preparation, none of that. You either have to live for something or you're going to die for nothing. And at that time, we was ready to live for something. There is hardly any dispute in the administration, the post office department, or among the business critics of the strike, 
that the postal worker's grievances are real. A letter carrier, no matter where he lives, starts at a salary of $6,176 a year. If he lasts 21 years, he may receive a top income of $8,442. The strike paralyzed the General Post Office building in Manhattan, which on a normal day handles the largest volume of mail in the country. Picket lines were set up early this morning, and the walkout, according to union officials, was 100% effective. The next day, nobody came to work. I mean, you heard of 97% of, of the carriers that's after all the pressure was put on us, still 97% were out. People were just boiling, and it just took a, like a match to ignite it. Branch 36 ignited it, and it just took off from there. I arrived for work at the Jersey City Post Office the morning of March 18th, and everyone on the workroom floor was talking about it. Late the night before, rank and file carriers in New York City had voted to strike and they were picketing the main post office on 8th Avenue in Manhattan. We all knew this was brewing, but somehow we couldn't believe it had finally happened. So, after we delivered our first trip, I convinced an older carrier to drive over there on our lunch break to check it out. We headed for the Holland Tunnel and the short trip into the city. When we got to the GPO, we were flabbergasted. <laughs> Hundreds of letter carriers with homemade picket signs were pacing the sidewalk on 8th Avenue. The building famously says, neither snow nor rain nor heat nor gloom of night would keep us from our appointed rounds. But no one ever said anything about a wildcat strike. We talked with many of our union brothers who were risking their jobs, their pensions, even arrest. I don't like to go on strike, but we must because they've been pussyfooting too long. You can't live in New York City on what they're giving us. We want to work, wanna but work this is right. the only means we have of letting Congress know that we cannot take it any longer. Either they give us what we should have, or we will stay out on strike until hell freezes over. We raced back to Jersey City and told our branch officers what we had just seen. We held a vote that night, and it was unanimous. We joined the strike the next morning. Striking is a serious decision for workers. They lose their income, often their benefits. Um, they engage and, and embark in, into a, an action that's uncertain. How long will it last? What will it cost? What risks do they put their family through? So they don't do that lightly. We watched others promote themselves through the use of strike. Teachers, sanitation workers, uh, they firefighters, police won't talk to strikes, that to get better wages, better working conditions. And we saw them succeed. Congress was already looking at reforming the Postal Service. Did they talk about the letter carriers? No. The letter carriers were the last in line. So it was finally up to the letter carriers to be fed up. In Washington, news of the walkouts triggered immediate responses from both our National Union and the Post Office Department. At the insistence of Postmaster General Blunt, NALC President James Rademacher sent a telegram to Branch 36 President Gus Johnson, urging him to get his members back to work. It literally went nowhere. Postmaster General called me, get down here right away. I got down as fast as I could and he said, you call in New York, you get them carriers back to work or else. There'll be no dues check off, your union's busted. There's no health benefit. There's all this and that. I said, okay, that's enough. You told me. So I sent Gus Johnson a letter knowing he's on the picket line. He couldn't get it. <laughs> he couldn't get the telegram I sent. Postmaster General Blunt lost no time in successfully petitioning the U.S. District Court to issue a federal injunction against the striking carriers. Rademacher was in a real jam sympathizing with our plight, yet careful to not officially sanction our legal actions. We're bound by 
executive order by the National Postal Agreement, by federal laws, to not condone such actions. But we say to government, our members have not, and they will not listen to us so long as their heartfelt grievances remain unresolved. The head of the mailman's union has ordered New York City letter carriers back to work following a federal injunction against their day-old strike. It was not immediately certain how many postal employees would comply. The next thing you know, we're on strike, and the national offices are telling us to go back to work. They weren't going to tell us anything we didn't already know because you can't strike the United States government. We were aware of that. But what are the, the factors? You know, what... What leads to such frustration? The first obligation of the president, which at that time was Mr. Rademacher, he had to preserve the union. He could have went and got a prison sentence out of it, not an overnight stay at the jail. They'll fine you X amount of dollars, take away many rights that the national had, and it'll destroy the union. Rademacher then telegrammed the leaders of his 300 largest branches calling them to Washington for an emergency session in just 48 hours. Meanwhile, the strike was spreading quickly in all directions. News of the week, this is Gabe. Gabe, it's Patty. I'm at the uh, postal strike headquarters. Is Doug there? No, he left. What are you doing there? The strike is going national. National? Well, how do you know? Do you have a, a... It's already spread to Chicago, Detroit, San Francisco. Ch check the wires. Patty said the mail strike's going national. It's not going to be on the wires, but it is real. In New York City and in some parts of Connecticut and New Jersey, the letter carriers are still carrying no letters. Their strike is illegal, but there is not much the government can do about it. I warned that the lid was going to blow. It's now blowing. Now they've got to react. A postal official was asked, what about the mail now lying in the street boxes and the post offices? And he said it would just lie there. Well, he was asked, what about perishables? And he said, they will just have to perish. At the White House, the mood was cautious. Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman chronicled Nixon's mindset throughout the strike with daily entries in his infamous diaries. Start of a postal strike today. That could spread beyond New York wants to be sure we do what we should. But unfortunately for Mr. Haldeman, he was a little late. The strike had already spread beyond New York City as Long Island, Connecticut, Philadelphia, and most of New Jersey walked out, including my own Branch 42 in Jersey City. That's me in the center of the group walking a picket line for the first time in my life. We learned that the strike vote in New York had been called for by a rank-and-file letter carrier named Vincent Sombrato. Sombrato was a Navy veteran of World War II who had been carrying mail for 23 years. He worked a second job as a truck driver to support his large family. Sombrato held no official position in the union, although he had become an activist at Grand Central Station in the months before the strike. We were just a group of people that felt that we were being taken advantage of. That we, and we couldn't make it. We couldn't raise families on what we were doing, applying ourselves. Every letter carrier that I knew had more uh, a source of income, worked on two jobs, three jobs, just to survive. So. We wanted to have one job and make a, 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 a decent living. And, and that was not possible at that time as we saw it. You know, when I read about letter carriers who were working two jobs or eligible for welfare, not able to take care of their family, I think that, I can't, I don't know what the words for it are. How can a person live? How can you live? I mean, you had to do what you had to do, you know? I mean, there was no way that I was going to quit. That's for sure. But it was stressful because I, I missed a lot of time with my family when they were growing up. I was hearing for the first time about people who could not afford to take care of their families, and people in New York had to go on welfare. And uh, I mean, it, it did something to you, it touched you. 
and you couldn't just stand by and let them go out alone facing who knows what. After Branch 36 did it, I think there was a there was a sense that we we want to express solidarity with these people because we they've we've come to respect them for what they're doing and think that it's important. When New York fell in and, and they said we're going out on strike, then like I said, at least in Philadelphia, that's all I can go by. And, and they started to say, well, we got to back them. They're our brothers. We were interested in making enough money to support our families. And so uh, when New York went out, that was definitely Wildcat. And it just caught on. And we wanted very much to be a part of it. With four children, I'm probably eligible for welfare. I've been told I'm eligible for welfare. But I don't want to take welfare. Sombrato's co-organizer was letter carrier Tom Germano. Germano worked at the GPO on 8th Avenue and coordinated the strike efforts at that station. People followed Vince, and, and he encouraged people with a sense of uh, strength. He was strong, he was smart, he was tough. People liked that. He was tough enough that you felt he'd stand up and be there for you. On the day before NALC's national emergency session, the union's executive council unanimously gave Rademacher the authority to act to restore service and to push for pay legislation. For its part, the administration tried to shift the blame from Nixon's broken promises to the inaction of Congress. The administration, the executive branch has no power to put into effect a pay raise. What has transpired is the result of frustrations of patients, the results of exhaustion of patients, and this is no surprise to the Congress who was alerted on June 26th last year that a postal strike could occur if postal employees were not treated properly. Back in New York City, Federal marshals served subpoenas on Gus Johnson and the officers of Branch 36, ordering them to return to work. I have one for Mr. Gus Johnson, president, that's what, which is you. Lou Yoko, editor of Branch 36. You know, there's only so much you can take. When the United States Congress votes himself for what, 41% pay raise? Mm. Well, year after year, we get, what, 1%, 2%? What do they expect? But your own union leadership was against the strike. Yeah, we're on strike anyway, so maybe they're not leaders after all. You know, a lot of the guys have been telling me they, they come to you for guidance, that you're the guy in charge. I'm just a letter carrier, 25 years in the job and not in anybody's pocket. You think your union leadership is in management's pocket? <laughs> Careful now. I didn't say that. If you put those words in my mouth, I'll come looking for you. And I'm a mailman. I can find you. <laughs> well, Vinny... Yeah? It's your lucky day. I've covered strikes. All comes down to leadership, and whether you like it or not, you're apparently the leader of this thing. Being a letter carrier is a good job. It should be better. And our union leadership has failed us. Friday, March 20th was a busy day in Washington. Rademacher had just gaveled to order the national emergency session of his 300 largest branches when Labor Secretary Schultz invited the seven union presidents to meet that afternoon. And I'm sitting down at my desk and I'm praying that there's, uh, I could get some wisdom and courage and strength to go through with this, because this, this is the worst thing that ever happened. The Postal Service on strike the president of the National Association of Letter Carriers, James Rademacher, before going off to meet with Labor Secretary Schultz, carefully walked the line between the illegality of the walkout and the possibility of an extended tie-up. Undoubtedly, unless some satisfaction comes of the meeting that is about to take place, that we can anticipate that on Monday there will be no mail delivery in the entire nation. The two-hour meeting was Schultz, Assistant Labor Secretary William Usury, Blunt, and the seven union leaders marked the first time in history that the federal government would negotiate with postal unions. Schultz warned that the government would not begin talks while workers were still out. What do they want? They want to have the issues discussed. 
And the way to get them discussed is to return to work uh, so that we can spend our time and energy and thought uh, on the issues and not on the question of how to resume postal service. I have agreed with them that uh, the only way that it can be resolved is if the work stoppages cease and then the administration can recognize responsible leaders in the negotiations. Rademacher returned to NALC's emergency session with the government's message. Now we have been negotiating for 14 months. We have gotten nowhere. I say that unless, until they produce a bill, there's no way. They come across with a bill acceptable to the membership, we'll return to work. Until that time, we stay out. was offered before of five days. I would like to ask for another amendment to be tacked on that the national president call a national strike if there is no agreement within five days. A delegate from Milwaukee got up and said, I give you five days to settle this strike. I said, okay, all in favor say aye. The vote was about 98% favor of what he said because they didn't really want to get out. They were obligated to the, their people they serve. But on the other hand, they had to eat. Later that evening, the union presidents met again with Schultz and Blunt and agreed on ground rules for the negotiations. Schultz assured the unions that the government would begin negotiating as soon as the strikers returned to work. We have assured them that uh, as soon as we know as soon as they are able to assure us and our information confirms that the work stoppages are ended. Uh, the administration, the post office, is quite ready to enter discussions immediately with the unions. Uh, and these discussions will be conducted promptly. But first, the mail must be delivered. People in my family talked about it. Um, how long you guys gonna be out? Um, people in my neighborhood talked about it. We talked about it at church. Whatever it takes. And I did have uh, one person ask me, what do you mean by whatever it takes? I said, whatever it takes. Rademacher was hopeful, but he was also criticized by many in the rank and file, putting him in a difficult position. My union brothers and I remained on the picket line in Jersey City. We repeated the jeer, Rat, Rat, Rademacher. Throughout the strike, Rademacher received threats and hate mail. I wasn't fit to live with. <laughs> My wife didn't fully understand what it was about, and she didn't like excitement like that. But uh, we survived. The people that uh, threatened me were some of our own members because I didn't lead. They didn't understand that if I left, there would be no union. There was no formal support, and it's apparent in looking back that there could not have been formal support. The unions, as they existed, could not have sanctioned a strike. They would be have been illegal. It would threaten their organization and their their officers. In Minneapolis, carriers voted after the Washington Agreement to strike at midnight tonight, saying Congress has consistently given us promises we're not going to work merely for more promises. And Pittsburgh postal leaders said their members would carry no mail to mark. When you get pushed against a wall, then you're going to fight back. And that's what actually the strike was. We, uh, All the letter carriers uh, fought back. And I still think to this day it was probably the, the greatest act of bravery by a bunch of people who were men who devoted themselves to the post office. None of us were giving in, so President Nixon decided to play hardball. Good evening. On Monday, I will meet my constitutional obligation to see that the mails go through. With those words, President Nixon faced up to an unprecedented crisis in the post office, the first strike in the 196 years since Benjamin Franklin set up the system. It is a domestic crisis with a potential economic impact, perhaps the greatest since the Depression. 
Since Wednesday, when 6,500 New York City letter carriers refused to shoulder their mail pouches, the strike has spread from coast to coast. Now it directly affects 14 states and has involved about 200,000 postal workers. President Nixon realized how important the mail was, that we were a big factor in our nation, because have not, without the mail going, it seems like everything just came to a standstill. H.R. Haldeman summed up Nixon's position in his diary. President first reaction was for really tough stand. If people can be fired, fire them. If troops can be moved, move them. All out attack, not worried about the mail, it's the principle. So the D.C. Bureau has the Nixon administration reaction and a report from the Under Secretary of Labor. Business? Business. Right, right. Because we want a full spread on what this is going to mean for Wall Street on Monday morning if the strike is still going. Any of the blue chip companies are going to have any problems with their payroll. Alex, make sure you call the mortgage lenders. I want to know what this means for homeowners. It's Saturday. You're a hell of a reporter. Nobody will be at work. Call them at home. Donald and Clem. I want you fellas to give me 500 words on the military angle. Draft notices, letters home. Right, what else? What else do we need to worry about? Mail order catalogs, social security checks, jury summonses, magazine subscriptions. It's gonna be tight sphincters in a lot of editors' offices before this thing's over. Mine's been clenched in 67. <laughs> <laughs> Some visible early effects of the mail strike. Stock market volume was down. Much more business was transacted by telephone and teletype. Special messengers carrying stock certificates and documents normally handled by mail. In the financial district, there was no way to schedule a stockholders meeting because there was no way to notify the stockholders or mail out the proxy statements. Credit cards could still pay for services, but cardholders could not be billed and could not pay what they owed. We stopped a lot of things. We stopped a whole lot of things. We stopped Wall Street. We stopped a lot of businesses, insurance companies. All this came through the mail. And we didn't know how long it was going to last. But I think most people had the impression it wasn't going to last long. Because it is commerce. We, we, we're talking about uh, bills and, and, and money and things that was being transferred. All taken for granted. Letter carriers taken for granted until they sent a shock wave through the country. That's what it took. In an attempt to get his members back to work so negotiations could begin, Rademacher telegrammed all 6,500 NALC branches, pleading with them to end their walkouts. Most agreed to return to work during the five-day cooling off period, but many of the larger branches, like Chicago, held their ground. Defiance began early in the morning here in Chicago when about 50 male men on the picket line voted to stay on strike despite a back-to-work court order. Well, what if what you're doing is illegal? I don't care. Now, I know it's against the law. That's in the Constitution. It's in my contract. If they want to put me in jail, put me in jail but they haven't got a jail big enough to put all of us in. We're having a tough time trying to keep the troops in line. For all practical purposes, uh, I think that they have uh, closed down the Chicago Post Office. Come down, I'd like you to get McGee now. I could take you in the Post Office and get him and me and go down there and throw a case, and he wouldn't know anything about the case. Uh, Mr. McGee, the postmaster, says he expects the letter carriers to be back at work by Monday. Never. What would it take to get you back to work? A pay raise. New York Branch 36 and Brooklyn Branch 41 were also unmoved. Our voice has not been heard. It is being heard now. All in favor of staying out, signify the state. The president is remaining very calm about this whole matter. By Monday morning, he and I are going to lose our cool, and something is going to be done. If he has to bring in the troops, I will oppose. But the people in this country are entitled to a mail service, 
and it's not the position of the president of the National Association of Letter Carriers to take our wrath out on the public of this great country, most of whom support our plight. Schultz and Blunt doubled down, saying no talks would begin until all strikers were back to work. But Schultz hinted that the rank and file was gaining ground. There's an old adage in the field of labor relations that there's only one thing worse than a wildcat strike, and that's a successful wildcat strike. President Nixon was clearly worried, not just about the postal strike, but about other potential walkouts in particular the air traffic controllers. The prospect of both a postal strike and an airline strike was unthinkable. Haldeman described Nixon's mounting anxiety. The settlement didn't work because rank and file won't go back, have rejected leaders. Walkout has spread to many other cities, including Chicago. Real danger of national strike. Says he'll bring all the troops home from Vietnam if he must to keep mail moving. What shocked the Nixon administration was that this strike that they thought would be confined to places like New York, maybe Philadelphia, and some other major cities, took off like wildfire. Despite Rademacher's best efforts, several large NALC branches stood their ground. Workers expressed anger and frustration. We've asked for it and asked for it, and they keep telling us they're going to give it to us, and they turn it down. And here we are going out begging every time we need a two-cent raise. They ran a bill through Congress to put, put an end to that rail strike in six hours. How come they can't get us a raise? Postal workers have been handicapped without any recourse to the courts or anywhere else. Congress, except for some phony promises they never fulfilled for many, many years. The point is simply this, is that the postal workers need more money. We feel that Mr. Nixon could have solved this whole thing 15 months ago. We have been waiting patiently for 15 months. Frustrated, and it's time for them to get some action. Nixon and his aides discussed using troops to move the mail. They knew that the backlash would be intense, both from the unions and the public. H.R. Haldeman summed it up. A busy day as the postal strike issue got worse. We'll see what the workers do in the morning. If they don't come back, President will move with troops. Consequence may be bad. President Nixon ordered the Army to go into New York City and to get the mail moving, and said if necessary, he would do the same in other cities. Last Saturday, I pledged to the nation that if the current situation existed on Monday, today that I would take action to fulfill my constitutional obligation. I have just now directed the activation of the men of the various military organizations to begin in New York City the restoration of essential mail services. Nixon did exactly what he had threatened to do. He declared a national emergency and activated some 25,000 troops from nearby installations in an attempt to move the mail in New York City. I think he's gonna cause a little trouble up there. There may even be bloodshed. I mean, he doesn't know the feeling of those people in New York because he hasn't actually seen them. Can you imagine a letter, uh, instead of having a letter carrier deliver the mail, having a guy with a bayonet walk into an office building, it, it's, it's going from the ridiculous to the sublime. Boy, the carriers are, are the heartland of America. It's, it's terrible. We want to go back to work, but we don't want to go back under collective begging. We want to go back under collective bargaining. At this time, we take the position, the rank and file, the people that are out in the street, the people that carry the bags, the people that sort the mail, that it's up to Congress to give us something, show us good faith, put something on the table, something that we can address ourselves to. We are all loyal Americans willing to go back to work, happy to go back to work, but we will not be coerced by troops. I can't believe it when I see it myself. I'm answering the President of the United States. He's making a speech about striking, and I'm telling him, look, you're not going to coerce us from going back to work. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. It really is. Once Vince 
went out on that strike and everybody saw, hey, that man ain't scared of nothing. <laughs> the troop call up was a big gamble for Nixon. Haldeman summarized the decision. President ordered troops into New York to take over essential mail services. A really busy and maybe momentous day as some of the big locals vote to go back to work. But New York's still out and troops moving in tonight. If no settlement soon, strike could easily spread back out across the country and into other unions. Despite most of the strikers having returned to work, our brothers and sisters in New York were still out, and Postmaster General Blunt refused to come to the table. At that uh, very instant uh, that we uh, come to the conclusion we are not dealing with a walkout situation, we are prepared to discuss the issues uh, with the employees on a full and free basis. On March 24th, troops started arriving in New York City. Before long, it became obvious that they had no idea what they were doing. Uh, the troops, when uh, we heard that they came in to deli quote, deliver the mail, we said, well, the president's got to do what he has to do, but they're not going to move anything. What exactly are you doing? I don't really know. <laughs> do you think uh, you're doing it as fast as a postal worker? No, I don't. No, he, he must have his own little tricks because I can't find half the slots. Jeffrey Chester is a retired letter carrier from Sacramento, California, and member of NALC Branch 133. But in 1970, he was on active duty stationed at McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. He was assigned to help move the mail in New York. They took us into the sorting section. They sat us down in the chairs, and they said, you're going to get trays of mail, and we want you to put them in those pigeonholes in front of you. And you had a full tray of mail, which is what, 300 pieces of mail? You'd think one bucket and one tray would be done. You'd think, all oh, right, and here come another one. You heard grumbling from the other people that were there, uh, of the fact that how can they people do this all day long? This would be something I would never want to do in my life. Well, as Jeff Chester came to learn, be careful what you wish for. After 26 years in the Air Force, he retired from the military and joined the Postal Service where he carried mail in Northern California for 20 years. It became clear very quickly that tossing military personnel into post offices and expecting them to even attempt to keep the mail moving was an exercise in futility. The government needed to get their postal employees back on the job, and that meant sitting down and negotiating. Further complicating an already complicated situation were major personality conflicts within the White House team. And the post office department, namely Postmaster General Blunt, resented Chuck Colson working directly with Rademacher. If you concerned about how this happened and how the, with the, the result in the deal that was made, it would happen with the President of the United States and uh, the leader of the Union. Uh, uh, Blunt was, he was different. Haldeman described the internal tension. Blunt and his deputy, Ted Klassen, trapped me in the late morning regarding White House staff interference in post office negotiations, especially Colson dealing with Rodemaker. They were really mad. It raises a basic question of who is to handle the negotiating. Ehrlichman and I agree it can't be Blunt, it must be Schultz. President agrees. Finally, the White House agreed to come to the table, but concerned that Blunt would foul the talks, Nixon bumped him from his negotiating position. In New York City, the last holdout, the executive board of Branch 36 voted to return to work. President Gus Johnson announced the end of the strike. As a consequence of the hardships we have all endured, and because of the absolute pledges given us by many of our friends in Congress, I hereby urge and direct the members of Branch 36, National Association of Letter Carriers, to return to work. Thank you. 
Did they want to go back to it? Of course they did. Were people frightened? Of course they must have been frightened all through it. Only a dumbhead like me was, you know, but I'm, I'm being honest about it. I didn't think of those times, but I should have been. Everybody should have been frightened. And with that, negotiations began in Washington at 2 p.m. and went late into the night. The parties agreed that preliminary negotiations would be limited to wages and that all other issues would be set aside until pay was resolved. The parties were far apart, and Rademacher remained acutely aware that the clock was ticking on the five-day grace period from his leadership. The situation was unsettled. The next several days were a slog with continuous back and forth between the parties. The mediation finally paid off on April 2nd. The unions would get 6% immediately. In exchange for endorsing postal reorganization, they would get an additional 8% once the bill was signed into law. And collective bargaining with binding arbitration was part of the deal. Also included was complete and total amnesty for all those involved in the strike, as well as compression from 21 years to eight years for postal workers to reach top pay. The deal was announced to the press from AFL-CIO headquarters. Though a crisis always presents trouble, it may also prevent opportunity, present opportunity. Parties to this agreement that have been reached today have seized that opportunity. I think that this in itself is a tremendously significant forward step in the history of labor relations in this country. This means that the federal government is taking the lead in solving this question of representation for public employees and they're resolving it by the method that we know best, collective bargaining. I think this is a very significant advance. Settlement day, postal agreement. Got our 6% plus 8% deal with reform and rate increase. Now have to sell it to Congress. The negotiation teams presented the deal to President Nixon at the White House. It still had to be approved by Congress, but it was essentially a done deal. Postal workers like me and my union brothers and sisters got a substantial increase in pay. Nixon got his Postal Corporation, and the Postal Unions got collective bargaining. After we settled in negotiations on the strike, it came out 14% pay raise, 6% to everybody, including federal employees, which I resented, and 8% was a gift. They said, we'll give you 8% if you accept collective bargaining. That's the biggest bargain there was. The fact that carriers all over the country, um, without a plan, without an organization, almost without communication with, with anyone else, just spontaneously because it was the right thing to do, it just went out. Um, I expect that was eye-opening for people in Washington who usually do need their eyes opened. <laughs> Plus the fact that they were talking about it was illegal and that we might go to jail. Uh, I knew that, but uh, that really didn't, didn't uh, concern me. I knew what we were doing was right. And uh, some, sometimes right wins out. Our way of thinking was they can't fire everybody because the mail would never get back running again. So we took the chance and the chance to pay it off. H.R. Haldeman, Nixon's uh, close advisor, said to him, the public likes their postal ser service person. They know their mailman. Uh, they don't want that person to be punished. And Nixon was a politician, uh, and he, he understood that there was public support. And so while he had the power to fire people, for having engaged in an illegal job action. He didn't use that power. And that was a tribute to the fact that the postal workers had enormous public support. 80% of the American people through the Gallup poll supported the letter carrier. President Nixon was aware of that. 
And that was his final decision when he exonerated every employee. See, Nixon was smart. And this, Nixon was a good president. He did a lot of good things. Believe me, he was a crook and he was, this, <laughs> and he was a liar. But he did good things. He, did, he was somebody that knew how to do things. He'd get things done. They called it the revolt of the good guys. It summed up not just how we felt about ourselves, but also how the public felt about us. Public support for our plight had forced Nixon to make a deal and to deliver to postal employees true collective bargaining. Collective begging would soon become just a bad memory and postal workers would take their honorable and well-deserved place in the American economy. And people were happy. They were, they were happy to get back to work. They were happy to know to some that they won. And I remember when I went back on my route, there were notes left in the mailbox. You deserved the raise. We didn't realize you were getting paid so little. Of course, the customers were uh, happy to see us, and, and they all uh, agree with us. Most of them agree with us that we did the right thing. We felt like we had asserted ourselves, like we had stood up for the right reasons, that we would get respect, that we would get some of the things that were promised for us, if not all of them, and that uh, there was hope. There was hope that things would change and change for the better. On August 12, 1970, the Postal Reorganization Act was signed into law by President Nixon after decades of lobbying by the NALC and an eight-day wildcat strike, dissolving the Post Office Department and establishing the United States Postal Service. At the same time, NALC members were assembling for the union's 47th biennial convention in Honolulu. One key person who was absent from the signing ceremony was Jim Rademacher, who was attending the convention. President Nixon recorded an audio message to the convention's attendees. I welcome this opportunity to extend my very best wishes to all of you at the Letter Carriers Convention. We had a big signing ceremony over at the Post Office Department last Wednesday. It was a happy occasion, but I have one great regret about it. I sincerely wish that Jim Rademacher could have been standing beside me, representing all of you when I wrote my name on that bill. Your organization's support and Jim's skillful leadership contributed more than I can say to this achievement. I congratulate all of you. You have good reason to be very proud of your association and of your president, Jim Rademacher. Last March, the power of the union was unleashed, and it was unleashed in a very surprising way and it made believers out of everyone, including the American people. Because of many reasons which I have discussed with you, I did not unleash that power myself, but I want here and now to pay tribute to those letter carriers who did break through the dam of repression. <laughs> and took their grievances and frustrations out into the streets for the world to see. It took golden guts to do that, and I want here and now to express admiration for those guts. Both groups, the actual strikers, the potential strikers, put enormous pressures on the representatives of management at the bargaining table. If there had not been such pressure, there wouldn't have been any bargaining table at all, and any negotiations that would have been attempted would have been a failure. So I congratulate all of you who were responsible for that trade event. Tip of the hat to, to Jim Rademacher. I mean, he was a soldier in this whole thing. And he had a big load and uh, a lot of responsibility uh, that was uh, um, placed on him. Without him, we would not have accomplished postal reform. The postal strike was just an enormous watershed. Uh, it was the largest by far strike of federal workers ever. About 200,000 workers, we estimate, participated in it. Nothing like that, no precedent for it ever. And it was nationwide. Uh, it spread across the country. Um, so it was a huge event, uh, sort of like a, a gigantic bomb exploding in its time. And it really altered the landscape of the country politically. 
uh, and paved the way for a big transformation in, in uh, how the federal government dealt with, with its workforce. I didn't recognize how big it was till years later. I mean, I, I, I knew it was big, but I, the magnitude of it, how we, we actually stopped the government. It's one of my proudest moments in my life that the, the fact is that we stood up for what we believed in and we went out and did what we had to do. We went from almost making nothing to making a pretty decent salary. And so uh, the strike, it was, it was uh, well worth it. It was a big sacrifice. The strikers, we kind of made history because I think if it wasn't for New York, Philadelphia and so forth, uh, we wouldn't have what we have today. It was probably the most monumental thing that happened in my lifetime. And they finally, when they negotiated a contract, everybody was elated. We got a contract with the Postal Service instead of having Congress in charge of deciding what we would be paid. I was able to quit my part-time job and have more time with my family and uh, able to accumulate some money to be banked. It had enormous consequences to the letter carriers. It became a middle-class job. It became a job you can raise your family in. It felt great. Um, knowing that we were going to be getting more benefits, more money. Uh, it just felt like, um, I said, well, maybe I'll be here a little longer than 10 years. I said, because now I think I kind of really like this job. Although the un union had a call for the strike, nevertheless, the union went forward from what the carriers had done and made something good happen for it. It showed that people could get together and create change, need a change. That democracy within a union and with any organization as a society is a good thing and it helps everybody. We need to let our members know the history and that the struggle is not over. We got to keep on struggling and keep this thing, uh, keep this postal service where we can have jobs with good benefits. But America, we need hope. You know, that's what they had in the 70s. I think that's part of the thing where that strike was. At that time, um, people knew we're going to have a better life. And people believed they're going to have a better life. Yes, I think the strike was a good thing because good things came out of it. And that's how we got collective bargaining. And we still have it. So it was a real good thing. And it kept on going throughout the years, you know, with that collective bargaining. and. Uh, cost of living, but that gets factored in all the time. That helped out a lot. He did leave the walkout. He's not even a unit official, he's just rank and file. Huh. And I stood up and spoke his mind before the vote, and everybody stood right on. All of a sudden, I had their leader. There he is. He looks so regular. What do you think it is about a guy like Benny that makes people want to follow him? They relate to him. He's one of their own. There was another important benefit of the strike. The NALC had identified a new upcoming leader in Vincent Sobrato. He was a star. That's what we called him in the old neighborhood. Star, because he was that good. He was a good leader. It had not it been for him to lead New York out, just think of where the Postal Service would be now. We probably wouldn't have nothing like we have now. He was a fighter. And imagine how many families are blessed because of him. All of us retirees all around the country because of him, we are so blessed. Just a year later, Sobrato would go on to defeat Gus Johnson for the presidency of Branch 36. In 1978, he was elected national president of the NALC, a position he held for 24 years. So we weren't always able to get exactly what we wanted and certainly not when we wanted it, but we had a tremendous influence on what ultimately became a highly democratic involved National Association of Letter Carriers 
and um, led to the new leadership, which was Vince moving from the local Branch 36 presidency to the presidency of the National Union in Washington, a phenomenon. When all was said and done, Rademacher, Nixon, and Sombrato each played a pivotal role in our struggle for wages, respect, and the ability to shape our future. Each of the three depended on the other two. Nixon needed postal reform. Rademacher needed the government to come to the table, and Sombrato forced them together by igniting the strike. Rademacher and Sobrato remained at odds for a long time. Their relationship strained from the divisions of the strike. But many years later, before their passings, they reconciled their differences and came to respect each other's contributions. At the NALC's 2008 convention in Boston, the two appeared together after a long hiatus. The final tally in what would historically become known as the Great Postal Strike of 1970 included more than a quarter million striking workers, nearly one-third of the postal workforce at that time. It affected 671 post offices in some of the largest cities in the country, as well as some of the smallest suburban outposts. Eight days in March of 1970 marked the tipping point for what had been a decades-long struggle for equality and respect. By standing in solidarity, we had finally realized the advice of Walter Ruther and formed a labor union with the power to make a difference. We returned to work elated that our long financial nightmare was over and hopeful for a brighter future for ourselves and for those who would follow us.